A survey on December 24th of the German order of battle in or near the eastern end of the bulge that the Germans had driven into the American line would lend some credence to Field Marshal Montgomery's immense concern. Five panzer divisions were already in action, and a sixth on the way. The panzer Lair and the second panzer pushing past Marsh for the Meuse, the 116th panzer trying to get across the marsh hotten Highway onto the Condros Plateau to assist that push, the 2nd SS Panzer and the 9th SS Panzer on the other side of the Orta River also trying to get onto the plateau, and the 9th Panzer on the way to help at Marsh. There was also the Führer Begleit Brigade, and such as was left of the 12th SS Panzer after its futile efforts to get past the Elsenborn Ridge. It was that formidable array that convinced Montgomery the Germans were getting ready for a powerful, concentrated effort, perhaps the most powerful blow since the start of the offensive. The array was actually more formidable on a G2 map than in reality, for except for the 9th Panzer Division, all the Panzer formations had already incurred heavy losses. Allied aircraft sharply curtailed their manoeuvres by day, and the men still fighting were close to exhaustion, their supplies, including gasoline, sharply diminished. The goal of the Meuse River was nevertheless close at hand. In quest of that goal, the commander of the 47th Panzer Corps, General von Lutwitz, Early on Christmas Day, sent contingents of the Panzer Lair Division from Rochefort to retake Humane and Buissonville, hoping thereby to reopen the shortest route westward and secure the north flank at the base of what von Manteuffel called the Pointed Wedge. At Humane, the light tanks and armoured cars of the 24th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron were no match for the German tanks and relinquished the village, but the loss made little difference, for General Collier's CCA maintained a firm hold on Buissonville. With Collier's powerful force on the north flank, neither von Lutwitz nor von Manteuffel was willing to send anybody else marching for the Meuse until at least a portion of the 9th Panzer Division arrived to hold that flank. In the countryside close to the Meuse River near Dinant, Christmas Day dawned with a light cloud cover, but that cleared early and both American and British fighter bombers were soon overhead. There were at first few targets, for the tanks and other vehicles of the two advanced forces of the 2nd Panzer Division, one in and around Foy, Notre Dame, the other in woods between Conjou and Selle, both with gasoline tanks almost dry, kept under cover. It remained for the 3rd Armoured Division's CCB under Brigadier General I.D. White to flush them. CCB began to advance shortly after daylight on Christmas morning, with two task forces marching down roughly parallel roads from assembly areas outside Sine, with plans to link at cells. Neither task force had any great difficulty. One moving from Achen on cells dug a few Germans from a forest alongside the road, and beyond the forest came under fire from tanks concealed among the buildings of a farm, but American fighter bombers drove the tanks out, four panthers and the American tanks and tank destroyers quickly destroyed them. The other task force had a brief engagement near Conjou, then pushed on in the face of fire from an occasional tank or anti-tank gun. In mid-afternoon, the two task forces linked on high ground overlooking cells and continued down into the village without resistance. Near the Pavillon Ardennes, the men saw a panther that had been disabled by a mine, but that was the only sign of the enemy. Covering the western flank of the advance, the 82nd Armoured Reconnaissance Battalion approached Foy, Notre Dame. Seeing German vehicles in the village, the commander of Company A, Captain James Hartford, sent a platoon to reconnoitre. When the Germans fired on the platoon, Hartford committed the rest of his company, then called on another company to help. Once the men knocked out an anti-tank gun near the centre of the village, the rest was mop-up. Just under 150 Germans surrendered. In the attack, the reconnaissance troops were helped by the five Shermans of the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, whose crews were relieved that the arrival of the American armour eliminated the requirement for them to make a last-ditch stand in front of the highway bridge at Dinant. Unfortunately, in the first meeting, the crew of an American tank mistook one of the British-operated Shermans for a German tank and knocked it out. As night fell on Christmas Day and General White made plans for mopping up the German pockets the next day, the only hope for the trapped Germans lay in relief forces breaking through. When a Kampfgruppe of the 9th Panzer Division arrived at last near Marsha, General von Lutwitz could send help, but not much. Through the night, a Kampfgruppe of the 2nd Panzer Division, all that was left, 
and another of the Panzer Lair Division toiled up the valley of the Lesser River toward Sells. Each force had not quite a company of tanks, about fifteen, a few Panzer Grenadiers and engineers, a light artillery battalion, and part of an anti-aircraft battalion. The Kampfgruppe of the 2nd Panzer Division was the first to arrive. As the column came within two miles of Selles, it seemed to the Germans that the ridge ahead of them was crawling with tanks. Before they could disperse into an attack formation, fire from American tanks and from artillery directed from spotter aircraft began to riddle their ranks. By way of the British tanks at Foy Notre Dame, General White called in a squadron of British typhoons, but since the Americans had no radio contact with the planes, the little artillery observation aircraft had to dive dangerously low to point out the German column, whereupon the British pilots went to work with deadly rockets. When the Kampfgruppe of the Panzer Lehr Division arrived, it received much the same reception. Learning of the disasters, General von Lutwitz ordered both columns to fall back on Rochefort, leaving the trapped men of the 2nd Panzer Division's spearhead to fend for themselves. That night, General von Manteuffel authorised them to break out on foot. Around 600 Germans eventually escaped. They had to leave behind all the vehicles and equipment of an entire Panzer Grenadier Regiment, a battalion of tanks, three artillery battalions, and the bulk of an anti-aircraft battalion. In the whole engagement, including the fighting at Buissonville, the 2nd Armoured Division knocked out or captured 82 tanks, 83 anti-tank and artillery pieces, and 500 other vehicles of various types. The division captured 1,213 Germans and killed at least another 900. The American division lost 28 medium tanks, 26 of which were soon back in action, 201 men wounded and 43 killed. The day after Christmas marked if not the absolute end, then at least the beginning of a precipitous end to the German offensive as Adolf Hitler had originally planned it. On that day, December 26th, the American defenders on the Elsenborn Ridge were still holding firm. The big attack on Christmas Day at Bastogne had failed. General Patton's attack against the southern flank was still underway, and a relief column entered Bastogne. The attempt by the 2nd SS and the 9th SS Panzer Divisions to break past Manhay failed. So, too, did the 116th Panzer Division's attempt to push beyond the marsh Hotten Highway. Many long, bitter days of combat were to pass before Hitler would finally admit that his grand offensive had failed. Indeed, that same day he was to announce new, grandiose plans to salvage something from it. Yet saner heads recognised that the Führer's desperate ambition, like a lone panther in the garden of the Cure of Foy, Notre Dame, three miles short of the Meuse River, lay broken in the snow. In the underground concrete chambers of the Adlerhorst near Ziegenberg Castle, Alfred Jodl, chief of OKW's operations staff, received a telephone call on the night of December 24th from General von Manteuffel. On the eve of the all-out attack to take Bastogne, to be launched just a few hours later on Christmas Day, von Manteuffel said it was impossible for him to continue driving for the Meuse River and still hoped to take Bastogne. The time had come, he said, for a completely new plan. Upon nearing the Meuse, he would wheel north and drive between the Orta and the Meuse. That would bring him in on the flank and rear of the American forces fighting south of Liège, at Malmedy, and on the Elsenborn Ridge. Such a plan clearly inferred abandoning Antwerp as an objective, and that, Jodl responded emphatically, the Führer would never countenance. He nevertheless promised to pass along von Manteuffel's recommendation. On Christmas Day, when Hitler finally arose, he appeared to be cheerful. Late in the day, he joined his staff around a candle-lit Christmas tree and, to everyone's surprise, drank a glass of wine and seemed to enjoy it. Yet his physical appearance continued to disturb everybody. His face was haggard and his voice quavered. His hand clasp was weak and soft. All his movements were those of a senile man. Late that night, his military advisers, along with Field Marshal von Rundstedt, joined him for a review of the military situation. There was immense concern about Russian advances in Hungary and speculation as to why the Russians had failed to open a new offensive in Poland. When the discussion turned to the Ardennes, there was a late report from Field Marshal Model. His Chief of Staff, General Krebs, had drafted it while Model was visiting the front. Yet for all the gloom Model had encountered there, he made no effort to alter the optimistic tone of Krebs's draft. 
even though Model often still spoke frankly to the Führer, he saw little point in inviting Hitler's wrath. Although the 5th Panzer Army would soon reach the Meuse, noted Model, the 6th Panzer Army had been unable to get across the Urter so that von Manteuffel's north flank was exposed. Meanwhile, the 7th Army was under heavy attack from the south. The 5th Panzer Army might be able to seize some unoccupied crossings of the Meuse, he failed to elaborate on what he meant by that, but Model considered it essential for von Manteuffel to turn his main force northward and in conjunction with the 6th Panzer Army eliminate the Americans fighting south of the Meuse and Liège, and Bastogne would have to be taken. Once all those goals were achieved, Model concluded, but merely as a sop to the Führer's ambition, not through any personal conviction, the drive for Antwerp might be resumed. After reviewing Model's report, General Yodel, who was another of the few still able to speak candidly to the Führer, paused for a moment. Mein Führer, he continued, we must face the facts squarely and openly. We cannot force the Meuse River. Hitler refused to accept that. We have had unexpected setbacks, he said, because my plan was not followed to the letter. On the other hand, all is not yet lost. As Hitler continued, it became clear that he had accepted von Manteuffel's and Model's recommendation to concentrate on eliminating the Americans south of the Meuse in the vicinity of Liège, but as a prerequisite, to remove the threat to the rear of the two panzer armies, he insisted on capturing Bastogne. Rejecting a proposal to seize Luxembourg City so as to bolster the morale of the troops, he also turned down a proposal from von Rundstedt to return to the earlier plan for the 15th Army, to drive down the valley of the Meuse behind Aachen and link with the forces in the Ardennes. That, he said, no doubt thinking of his field commander's espousal of the small solution, would be too costly and would take away resources from the final objective, which he still intended to pursue. Cross the Meuse and capture Antwerp. Three days later, on December 28th, Hitler admitted that the situation in the Ardennes was serious, even desperate, but then added, as much as I may be tormented by worries and even physically shaken by them, nothing will make the slightest change in my decision to fight on until at last the scales tip to our side. By attacking in the Ardennes, he said, he had forced the Americans to withdraw 50% of their strength from other parts of the front, which left those sectors extraordinarily thin. Jabbing a finger at a large map on the wall, he indicated the province of Alsace in the northeastern corner of France, there, on New Year's Eve, he announced, he was launching a new offensive, it had been in preparation since December 22nd, to be known as Operation Nordwind. It would force the Americans to pull back the divisions that were threatening the southern flank in the Ardennes, and with the collapse of that threat, the main offensive in the Ardennes would then be resumed, he stressed the words with a fresh promise of success. Field Marshal Model, said Hitler, was to consolidate his holdings and reorganise for a new attempt on the Meuse. He was also to make another powerful assault on Bastogne. Above all, we must have Bastogne. At Field Marshal Montgomery's invitation, General Bradley flew on Christmas Day, by a roundabout route avoiding the bulge in the American line, to confer with Montgomery. When Bradley landed at St. Trond, northwest of Liège, nobody from Montgomery's staff was there to meet him, which Bradley took to be a calculated insult. He was tempted to turn around and go home, but when General Hodges's aide-de-camp, Major William C. Sylvan, arrived in a staff car, he decided to proceed. Montgomery's headquarters was in a modest house in Zonhoven, a few miles north of Hasselt. Montgomery offered neither food nor drink. Bradley had had only an apple for lunch, but began immediately to lecture his guest. I was absolutely frank with him, Montgomery reported later to Field Marshal Brooke. I said the Germans had given us a real bloody nose. It was a proper defeat, and we had much better admit it. It was, said Montgomery, entirely our own fault for trying to advance in two columns rather than putting everything behind the thrust north of the Ardennes. The enemy saw his chance and took it. Now we were in a proper muddle. Montgomery told Brooke he felt sorry for Bradley. He looked thin and worn and ill at ease. According to Montgomery, Bradley agreed entirely with everything he said. Poor chap, he is such a decent fellow and the whole thing is a bitter pill for him, but he is man enough to admit it, and he did. Bradley saw it quite differently. He found Montgomery more arrogant and egotistical than ever, 
lecturing and scolding him like a schoolboy. Bradley was so enraged and so utterly exasperated that it was all he could do, while seething inside, to keep silent. Most disturbing of all to Bradley was Montgomery's view on attacking to erase the German bulge. Convinced that the Germans were still capable of another major blow, Montgomery said he had no intention of attacking until he was certain the enemy had exhausted himself. The First Army was too weak to go on the offensive, and the Third Army's attack would accomplish little. The proper course was for everybody to go on the defensive and in the south to withdraw to a shorter defensive line, possibly as far back as the Vosges Mountains, in order to free divisions to strengthen Hodges's First Army. As Bradley understood him, although Montgomery subsequently denied it, he believed it would be three months before Hodges would be capable of a major offensive. The meeting lasted only half an hour, and Bradley flew back to his headquarters in a mood to match the gathering blackness of the night. Late that evening he had a talk with George Patton, who found Montgomery's ideas disgusting. If ordered to fall back, Patton thought he would ask to be relieved. Montgomery was just a tired little fart. The next morning, Bradley telephoned Eisenhower's headquarters, talked with the chief of staff, Bedell Smith, and let him have it with both barrels. Montgomery, he said, was throwing away an opportunity to inflict a devastating defeat on the enemy. He wanted the 1st and Ninth Armies returned to his command immediately, whereupon he would move his headquarters to Namur to assure proper coordination and get some action in the north. Still seething, Bradley took the extraordinary step of writing to one not then under his command, Courtney Hodges. While making it clear that his letter should in no way be considered a directive, he said he failed to view the German situation in as grave a light as did Montgomery. Although conscious that the First Army had absorbed a heavy blow, he believed the Germans had lost much more heavily and were so weak that an attack by the First Army would force them to get out in a hurry. He urged Hodges to look for an opportunity to attack as soon as the situation seems to warrant. That night, December 26th, aware of the death blow that Ernie Harmon's 2nd Armoured Division was administering to the spearhead of the German offensive near Sells, Bradley again telephoned Bedell Smith. Damn it, Bedell, he said. Can't you people get Monty going in the north? As near as we can tell, the other fellows reached the high watermark today. Before daylight on Christmas Eve, two small converted cargo ships, one British, the SS Cheshire, the other Belgian, the Leopoldville, set sail from Southampton across the rough waters of the English Channel, bound for the French port of Cherbourg. Each carried 2,200 American soldiers of the 262nd and 264th Infantry Regiments, the vanguard of the 66th Infantry Division, scheduled to relieve the 94th Infantry Division that was containing Germans holding out in ports in Brittany, and so release that division for commitment in the Ardennes. Three British destroyers and a French frigate served as escort. A German submarine, U-486, one of a new class equipped with a snorkel, lay on the channel floor five miles outside the breakwater at Cherbourg. As part of the German Navy's support of the offensive in the Ardennes, U-486 and a number of other submarines had received orders early in December to begin operations in the Channel. Under the command of 1st Lieutenant Gerhard Meyer, U-486 had assumed its station the night before, December 23rd. As the Allied convoy reached open waters, the sea was running heavy. It was bitterly cold. All through the day, most of the soldiers aboard the two troopships were seasick. In the crowded compartments below decks on the Leopoldville, the air was fetid. By 5 p.m. it was dark enough for Lieutenant Meyer to chance bringing his craft to the surface. Some 30 minutes later, a lookout picked up the approaching convoy. Slightly before 6 o'clock, Meyer gave the order to fire a torpedo, which headed unerringly for the Leopoldville. The torpedo struck the vessel's starboard side aft and exploded in number 4 hold. At least 300 soldiers died from the explosion or drowned in the water that swiftly flooded two of the troop compartments. All lights went out and the ship's engines stopped. Among the troops there was no panic. They took their places on deck as they had learned to do earlier in the day in a lifeboat drill. While some helped carry injured to the ship's infirmary, word passed among the men that tugs were coming to tow the ship into the harbour at Cherbourg. That seemed logical for the lights of the port were clearly visible. 
to shore-trained eyes only a short distance away. There were indeed plenty of tugs at Cherbourg and many another vessel that might be used for rescue, but for a long time nobody notified American Army and Navy headquarters in the port about the disaster. The senior British commander, Lieutenant Comder John Pringle, captain of HMS Brilliant, had no radio communications with Cherbourg, and even though he notified authorities in Southampton, they failed to pass the word along. Not until 6.25pm, almost half an hour after the torpedo hit, did anybody notify Cherbourg, and then it was a blinker message from HMS Brilliant stating only that the Leopoldville had been hit and needed assistance. That message mystified officials at the port. What kind of assistance? Every request by blinker message for additional information went unanswered. That contributed to the delay in sending help. Even greater delay stemmed from the fact that it was Christmas Eve and every man who could be spared was on leave. It was close to seven o'clock, a full hour after the torpedoing, before the first rescue craft left the harbour. Meanwhile, HMS Brilliant, along with the other British destroyers and the French frigate, was looking for the German submarine and dropping depth charges. All the while, U-486 lay on the bottom of the channel, its motors silent. Neither Lieutenant Meyer nor any of his 48-man crew felt any elation. They knew they had scored a hit, but thought they had only grazed their target. The big problem aboard the Leopoldville was that nobody knew how extensive was the damage. The skipper, Captain Charles Limbaugh, made no attempt to check it, and somebody, nobody would ever determine who it was, kept announcing over the public address system that there was no danger of sinking. Several times the word went out that tugs were coming to tow the Leopoldville into port, at other times that all passengers were to be transferred to other ships, yet always no danger of sinking. To the soldiers that made the behaviour of the Belgian crew, mostly men from the Belgian Congo, incomprehensible. The entire crew except for the four senior officers early made for the lifeboats, climbed aboard and launched them. A few US soldiers joined them, and others filled one of the boats until an officer ordered them out. There was no danger of sinking. As the powerless Leopoldville began to drift, Commander Pringle aboard the Brilliant ordered Captain Limbaugh by blinker signals to drop anchors. Learning finally that there were many wounded aboard the troop ship, Pringle stopped his search for the U-boat and came alongside the Leopoldville. Although he intended only to remove the wounded, the British sailors encouraged other soldiers to come aboard. In the rough seas, getting anybody across from the Leopoldville to the Brilliant was more than perilous, it was death-defying. With virtually no crew left aboard the troop ship, hardly anybody knew how to moor the two vessels. It took considerable time before British sailors manning the Leopoldville's anti-aircraft guns and American soldiers accomplished the task. Even then the lines broke constantly, and others had to be secured to keep the two vessels close together. They were never exactly parallel. Over and over again, both vessels rose and fell in the heaving seas, came together with a grinding, crushing noise, pulled apart, then came together once more. Many men nevertheless heeded the cries of the British sailors. Jump, Yank! Some mistimed their jumps and fell between the two ships, there to be crushed when next the two vessels surged together. That discouraged many others from jumping, and even though the Leopoldville had developed a strong list, there was still no word from anybody in authority that it was sinking. Was it safer to stay with the ship or jump? As second Lieutenant Harry Piper saw it, it was like trying to jump on a big bobbing cork on a rough pond. At one second, Brilliant was crashing the side of our ship some 15 feet below me. Then it was at my level, but 15 feet out. There was no telling where it was going to be at the next second. A former football player at the University of California, Piper finally jumped and just managed to grab a handhold on the lifelines of the destroyer's deck. Seconds before the two ships crashed together again, he swung his feet over the railing. They tried at first to transfer the wounded by means of lines and pulleys, but there was no way to keep the stretchers flat, and even though strapped down, men slipped off into the sea between the two vessels. One soldier with both arms in splints began slipping while halfway across, slowly, head first, desperately but futilely clutching the sides of the litter with his feet. The better way seemed to be to throw the wounded across, either on their stretchers or in wicker basket sea litters, sometimes in a sheet or a blanket. Aboard the brilliant, British sailors and American soldiers who had made the jump tried to catch them, to cushion their fall, 
but some hit the deck hard. There was still no word to abandon ship. Although Captain Limbaugh ordered the few of his crew who were still aboard to leave, nobody told the soldiers what to do. Again, why make that perilous jump when there was no danger of the Leopoldville going down? Nor did anybody tell Commander Pringle that the Leopoldville was mortally wounded. For the better part of an hour, the Brilliant remained alongside, but as boats from Cherbourg began to arrive, Captain Pringle pulled away. He had already taken on a heavy load, he needed to get the wounded to Cherbourg for medical attention, and he presumed that the arriving craft would be able to take the other troops off, should that prove necessary. Had he realised that the Leopoldville was sinking, he might have considered towing the vessel, but that would have been difficult because the Leopoldville, at his order, had dropped anchors, and no crewmen remained to hoist them. Not long after the Brilliant departed, word began to pass among the soldiers that the Leopoldville was doomed. The ship's list was becoming more pronounced every minute. When two small tugs came alongside, some soldiers got aboard. Others turned to nine remaining lifeboats, which they managed with great difficulty to launch, but none carried its full capacity. In lifeboats with a total capacity of 590 men, 300 got away. There were still many men who made no effort to leave the ship, for as a battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel J. Ralph Martindale later noted, until one minute prior to sinking, all indications and all information indicated that the ship would stay afloat. At close to 8.30pm, the ship gave a sudden lurch. Then came a rumbling, like the beating of drums in a serious symphony, the drums getting louder and louder. Hatch covers blew off. The ship began to upend, going down by the stern while at the same time rolling to one side. Life rafts broke loose, crashing among the soldiers. Steel helmets careened about the decks. Some men fell overboard, others threw themselves into the water. Almost to a man they still wore their heavy woolen overcoats beneath their little life jackets. When waterlogged, those pulled many a man to his death. Some still refused to enter the icy water, but as the ship assumed the vertical, they had no choice. Others were still trying to climb the rapidly rising decks when the ship plunged beneath the water. Once in the water, panic at last engulfed many of the men. They grabbed at other people, dragging them under. They fought for positions on the small life rafts, to be first to be pulled aboard lifeboats, tugs, PT boats, destroyers. Many a man hefted aboard one of the craft was already dead from hypothermia or drowning. The crews threw their bodies overboard to make room for the living. When the ghastly ordeal was finally over, 500 more men from the Leopoldville, plus Captain Limbaugh, who went down with his ship, were dead. Counting the 300 who died at the start, that made a total of 800 or more, the worst disaster to befall a troop ship carrying American soldiers during the course of the war. Between the time the torpedo struck and the Leopoldville went under, two and a half hours elapsed. At least 500 men went to their deaths in the cold waters of the English Channel who should have lived. Yet in view of the delay in communications with Cherbourg, the bungling and indecision, the early departure of the Belgian crew, and the lack of information or direction from the bridge, it was incredible that the toll was no higher. Like General Bradley, General Eisenhower was anxious for Field Marshal Montgomery to attack, but in one respect he was thinking like Montgomery. Because of the slowness of General Patton's advance on Bastogne, Eisenhower saw a pressing need for more divisions. The 17th Airborne Division had yet to arrive from England, and the tragedy at sea meant that the 94th Infantry Division would have to continue the task of containing Germans in the ports of Brittany. That left him with only two divisions not yet committed. The 11th Armoured Division, just arrived from England, and the 87th Infantry Division, which the 7th Army had pulled from the line by extending the sectors of other divisions. Yet so long as the Germans continued to attack, Eisenhower was reluctant to commit those two divisions. At his daily staff conference on December 26th, he ruled that the commander of the 6th Army Group, General Devers, would have to withdraw from the Saar and Rhine rivers back to the Vosges, thereby shortening the line and freeing two or three divisions. That decision taken, although yet to be implemented, Eisenhower prepared to meet Montgomery in Brussels. Even though telephone communications were functioning satisfactorily, Eisenhower found the telephone no substitute for face-to-face -face conversation. Because of his staff's continuing concern for his safety, he agreed to go by special train. 
planning to depart that night, the 26th, but before anybody boarded the train, the Luftwaffe bombed it, and it was noon the next day when Eisenhower finally got underway. At a staff conference before leaving, he learned that Montgomery was at last contemplating attack, to which Eisenhower responded, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Partly because of security precautions, which annoyed Eisenhower, the journey was slow, and the roads were so icy that he headed not for Brussels, but for Hasselt, which was considerably closer to Montgomery's forward headquarters. It was near midday on December 28th before the train reached Hasselt and Montgomery came aboard. Eisenhower found Montgomery still convinced that the Germans had one more full-blooded attack left in them. He apparently based that belief on the estimates of his G2, Brigadier Williams, who, like most Allied intelligence officers, was at that point living by the adage, once burned, twice cautious. An aerial reconnaissance report of a concentration of 500 German vehicles led Williams's staff to speculate that the Germans might be moving up one, perhaps two more SS Panzer divisions to assemble a corps behind the SS Panzer divisions on the northern flank to deliver next breakout. The British Joint Intelligence Committee was also being cautious, noting that the Germans had failed to reach either their intermediate or long-range objective and thus might well release additional reserves for a final lunge. That kind of caution failed to meld with the intercepts that Ultra was producing. Most intercepts pointed to the Germans being in serious straits, with heavy tanks losses and suffering from an acute shortage of gasoline. Although there were indications that they were shifting some formations already committed toward Bastogne, there was none indicating a build-up in the north. Montgomery told Eisenhower that while he awaited the expected blow, he was beginning to replace General Collins's troops at the tip of the bulge from Rochefort to Hotton with British troops, thereby enabling Collins finally to assemble for an attack. When Eisenhower raised the possibility that the Germans might not in fact mount another major thrust, Montgomery promised that if it failed to develop, he would start General Collins's attack six days later, on January 3rd. With that assurance, Eisenhower telephoned his headquarters to direct release of the 11th Armoured and 87th Divisions to General Patton. Before Eisenhower departed, Montgomery raised the issue that had so long complicated Allied command relationships. When the Allied armies renewed the drive into Germany, Montgomery insisted that he be designated overall ground commander, and in particular that he have command over Bradley's 12th Army Group. As Eisenhower left, Montgomery thought he had won his point, so he reported to Field Marshal Brooke, but Brooke thought otherwise. It looks to me, Brooke confided in his diary, as if Monty, with his usual lack of tact, has been rubbing into Ike the results of not having listened to Monty's advice. Nevertheless, emboldened, Montgomery the next day wrote Eisenhower a letter that, if not insubordinate, was at least insolent and arrogant. Because of Eisenhower's failure to designate an overall commander for a principal Allied thrust north of the Ardennes, he inferred, they had already had one very definite failure, so that the time had come for Eisenhower to be very firm on the subject. No loosely worded statement would do. He proceeded even to write Eisenhower's directive for him. From now onwards, full operational direction, control and coordination is vested in the CNC 21 Army Group, subject to such instructions as may be issued by the Supreme Commander from time to time. He considered it essential that all available offensive power be assigned to a northern thrust, and that one man should direct and control that thrust, without which, he concluded, I am certain that we shall fail again. In view of all the earlier disagreements over ground command and a single thrust into Germany, that letter in itself would have been enough to submit the Supreme Commander's patience to rigorous testing. As it happened, it came at a time when the voice of the British press had become strident, maintaining that Montgomery had saved the Americans from the consequence of their follies and that he would rightly go on to lead all the Allies to victory. Once General Marshall in Washington learned that the British press was predicting that Eisenhower was to name Montgomery as overall ground commander, he cabled Eisenhower that, in his opinion, there should under no circumstances be any concessions of any kind whatsoever, for that would create a terrific resentment in the United States. At that point, there were 42 American divisions on the continent as against 19 from Britain and the Commonwealth countries, and the margin was bound to increase. You are doing a fine job, Marshall concluded, and go on and give them hell. 
As for Eisenhower and many senior members of his staff, Montgomery's letter generated deep resentment. They saw it as an ultimatum. Almost everybody, including Eisenhower's British Deputy Supreme Commander, Air Marshal Tedder, considered that the time had come for a showdown. Either Eisenhower or Montgomery had to go, and given the preponderance of forces that the United States was contributing to the alliance, quite clearly it would not be Eisenhower. Through a phantom liaison officer at Bradley's headquarters in Luxembourg City, Montgomery's chief of staff, General de Guingand, learned of the deep resentment the reports and editorials in the British press had generated. That prompted him to telephone Walter Bedell Smith at Versailles, from whom he learned that Montgomery's message had upset everybody. An extremely dangerous situation had developed. Despite de Guingand's position on Montgomery's staff, the Americans trusted him, and he knew it. If he could get from Brussels to Versailles in time, thought de Guingamp, perhaps he could head off a showdown. Yet throughout the morning of December 30th, abominable flying weather appeared to forestall that. Not until early afternoon did the weather clear sufficiently to risk takeoff. Even then it was a hair-raising ride, and several times the pilot contemplated turning back, until at last he got a glimpse of the Seine and followed it at treetop level to Orly Airfield outside Paris. At the Trianon Palace Hotel, de Guingand learned from Bedell Smith that he might be too late. Together, the two went to a small house in A.J. nearby Forest, where Eisenhower's security officers had insisted that Eisenhower stay until the apparent threat to his life passed. In a somberly lighted room, full of smoke from Air Marshal Tedder's pipe, but made somewhat more cheerful by a healthy blaze in the fireplace, Eisenhower explained the intolerable position in which the British press reports and Montgomery's insistence on overall command placed General Bradley. Eisenhower said he was tired of the whole business and had concluded that it had become a matter to be decided by the combined chiefs of staff. He had already drafted a message to be sent through General Marshall to the combined chiefs, stating explicitly that they would have to choose between him and Montgomery. Should the combined chiefs decide in favour of Eisenhower, the British commander in Italy, Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander, would be an acceptable substitute for Montgomery well aware that it would be Montgomery who would have to go, but wanting no showdown in any case, de Guingand insisted that his chief had no inkling of the resentment his letter had fostered. He was convinced that once Montgomery understood, he would back down and cooperate. Withhold the message to Marshall for 24 hours, implored de Guingand to afford him an opportunity to talk with Montgomery. To both Eisenhower and Tedder, it seemed that the damage had already been done, and neither was inclined to agree. Only when Bedell Smith took de Guingan's side did Eisenhower relent. He would sit on the message for a day. Back in General Smith's office, de Guingan sent a message to Montgomery, saying that he planned to fly back the next day and come to Zonhoven to discuss an important matter. But because of continued bad weather, it was 4.30pm before he reached Montgomery's headquarters. Since Montgomery was just sitting down to tea, de Guingand joined him. Neither man interrupted the ritual to discuss business. Rising, Montgomery said, I'm going upstairs to my office, Freddy. Please come up when you have finished your tea. When de Guingand came upstairs, he put the matter bluntly. I've just come from Schaefe and seen Ike, he said, and it's in the cards that you might have to go. Explaining the hard feelings at Eisenhower's headquarters in some detail, de Guingand told of the message Eisenhower was planning to send to Marshall. He believed the situation could be put right, de Guingand concluded, but it required immediate action. To de Guingand, Montgomery seemed genuinely and completely taken by surprise and found it difficult to grasp what he was saying. He looked completely nonplussed. I don't think I had ever seen him so deflated. It was as if a cloak of loneliness had descended upon him, asked Montgomery, what shall I do, Freddy? De Guingand pulled out a message he had already drafted, and with a few changes, Montgomery approved it. He had seen Freddy, the message began, and understood from him that Eisenhower was greatly worried by many considerations. He had given Eisenhower his frank views, because that was what he believed Eisenhower wanted, but he was sure there are many factors which have a bearing quite beyond anything I realise. The message concluded. Whatever your decision may be, you can rely on me 100% to make it work, and I know Brad will do the same. 
Very distressed that my letter may have upset you, and I would ask you to tear it up. Your very devoted subordinate, Monty. Over icy roads, de Guingand drove to the 21st Army Group's rear headquarters in Brussels, where he spoke candidly to four prominent British news correspondents. Montgomery's command of American forces, he explained, had been a temporary expedient, and in view of the overwhelming number of American troops in Europe, pressure for an overall British ground commander was not only self-defeating, but dangerous. With the newsmen promising to consult their editors, de Guingand telephoned Versailles. Bedell Smith told him that Eisenhower had received Montgomery's message, had been most touched, and the signal to Washington now reposed in the waste paper basket. The next day, Eisenhower forwarded to all three Army Group commanders an outline plan for future operations, which he had just finished drafting when the crisis with Montgomery arose. In it, he proposed to reduce the bulge in the Ardennes by immediate attacks from north and south, with Montgomery continuing to command in the north until the First and Third Armies linked, whereupon Bradley was to resume command of the First Army. As he explained to Montgomery in a covering letter, also written before he received Montgomery's apology, he was leaving the Ninth Army under Montgomery for reasons of military necessity, a decision, he said, that most assuredly reflects my confidence in you personally. Yet in the matter of command, he could go no further. That crisis between Eisenhower and Montgomery was as close as Adolf Hitler came to precipitating a break in the Western Alliance, and it was nowhere near a break. However heated and serious, it remained merely another difference of opinion between field commanders, a controversy in large measure generated by a mercurial press always ready to champion dissension and preach disaster. Not just the British press, for the American press was complaining vehemently that Montgomery had committed no British troops to help in the Ardennes. The insensitive Montgomery was destined to provoke controversy again a few days later, and the chief of the Imperial General Staff, Field Marshal Brooke, who constantly lamented the inexperience of senior American commanders in handling large masses in battle, would for long persist in raising the issue of a more effective overall control of the ground forces. But it remained an intramural issue among military men that in the end had no appreciable effect on conduct of the war by the Anglo-American alliance. The bulge in the American line was 40 miles wide at its base, 60 miles deep at the apex. The problem was how to eliminate it, to George Patton, who had disliked the assignment of relieving Bastogne because it diverted him from the obvious solution, the answer was simple, the same as that taught between wars at the Command and General Staff College, cut it off at the base. If you get a monkey in the jungle hanging by his tail, said Patton, it is easier to get him by cutting his tail than kicking him in the face. He wanted to assume the defensive at Bastogne, and with a reinforced 12th Corps under Manton Eddy in the lead attack northeastward across the Schur and our rivers into Germany to Bitburg and Prim, there to link with a drive by the First Army southeastward from the Elsenborn Ridge. Those drives would penetrate deep into the enemy's rear and trap all the forces that had plunged into the Ardennes. The First Army's Courtney Hodges agreed, but only in principle. Hodges saw the road net leading southeast from the Elsenborn Ridge to Prum as too limited to support a major advance, a view that the German commanders who had had such a task toiling through the Lossheim Gap would certainly have seconded. The man whom Montgomery had designated to spearhead the attack from the north, Joe Collins, had a proposal that would eliminate that problem and still cut the base of the German salient. Move his corps behind Malmedy and drive southeast on St. Vith while Patton drove north up the Skyline Drive. When Montgomery visited Collins in the Chateau de Bessines on several occasions after the stopping of the 2nd Panzer Division near Sells, Collins pressed that plan while at the same time urging Montgomery to get on with the attack before the Germans could consolidate their gains. Yet every time, Montgomery reiterated his concern for still another major German blow, which might well pierce the First Army's lines. Nobody, replied Collins, was going to break through such top-flight divisions as the 1st, 2nd, 9th and 30th, the 3rd Armoured, and the 82nd Airborne. When Montgomery insisted it would be impossible to supply a corps over a single road, that from Malmedy to St. Vith, Collins responded, Well, Monty, maybe you British can't, but we can. On December 27th, Collins presented his plan to drive from Malmedy to St. Vith to General Hodges, 
but in view of Montgomery's objection, he proposed two other possibilities. Both aimed at Hoofalis for link-up with troops of the Third Army advancing north from Bastogne. Hodges chose to endorse one of those. On the same day, before Eisenhower left by train for his meeting with Montgomery, Bradley visited him with his own proposal for eliminating the bulge. Patton, said Bradley, should attack with Middleton's Eighth Corps from Bastogne on Hoofalis, and with Milliken's Third Corps northeastward on St. Vyth. To ensure that Patton did not shift instead to the drive he wanted on Bitburg and Prim, Bradley specified that the two new divisions afforded Patton, the 11th Armoured and the 87th, had to be employed with the 8th Corps in the vicinity of Bastogne. Hodges was to drive with Collins's 7th Corps on Hoofalis and with Ridgeway's 18th Airborne Corps push southeast on St. Vith. Again, Bradley urged Eisenhower to return the 1st and 9th Armies to his command, and again he said that he would shift his headquarters to Namur. While disapproving any immediate change in command, Eisenhower approved Bradley's plan of attack. When Montgomery subsequently agreed, at last persuaded by Joe Collins not to strike at the tip of the German salient, not to kick the monkey in the face, it became the Allied plan. It was no drive to cut the enemy's feet from under him and trap him in the Ardennes, it was instead a conservative push against his waist, combined with drives not unlike two windshield wipers sweeping the enemy back like raindrops towards St. Vith. When von Rundstedt learned the nature of his enemy's riposte, he called it, not without a touch of irony, the small solution. In ordering a diversionary attack against the 6th Army Group to force the Americans to pull some of their divisions from the Ardennes, Adolf Hitler displayed considerable prescience for in taking over much of the Third Army's front to allow Patton to attack and in releasing the 87th Division, General Devis's command had become gravely overextended. Devis's 7th US Army and 1st French Army held a line 240 miles long, which included a big re-entrant known as the Colmar Pocket that afforded the Germans a sally port west of the Rhine. General Eisenhower constantly worried about that extended line, and told Devers on several occasions that he had to be prepared to give ground rather than endanger the integrity of his forces. By Christmas Eve, it was already apparent that the Germans were planning an attack of some kind in the South. Excellent agent sources for which read Ultra, noted Devers's G2, Brigadier General Eugene L. Harrison, report enemy units building up in the Black Forest area just east of the Rhine for offensive. That was one consideration behind General Eisenhower's decision two days later, on December 26th, for Devers to pull back to the Vosges Mountains. But Devers interpreted that not as a directive, but as another warning of what he might be called upon to do. On New Year's Eve, the 6th Army Group was still in place along the German frontier and the Rhine in the sharp angle that is the extreme northeastern corner of France and around the periphery of the Colmar Pocket. By that time, indications of a German build-up and probable attack were clearer still. As before the attack in the Ardennes, Ultra was telling nothing specific, but was providing considerable information on the assembly of German troops. Several reports provided fairly accurate indications of the enemy order of battle. Another noted that replacements for the 17th SS Panzergrenadier Division were being rushed forward, and yet another revealed that the 21st Panzer Division was moving south. Those intercepted messages, when combined with prisoner interrogations and aerial reconnaissance, made it clear that an attack was coming, either on New Year's Eve or at the latest on New Year's Day. In response to Eisenhower's warnings about possible withdrawal, General Devers, the only senior American commander whom Eisenhower had had no hand in selecting, and thus one in whom he was never fully confident, had designated three fallback positions, the last being the line of the Vosges, but he had ordered no withdrawal. One reason was Devis's concern for French sensibilities, for any large-scale withdrawal involved relinquishing the city of Strasbourg. The French, de Vernieu, saw Strasbourg symbolically as the capital of Alsace and Lorraine, the two provinces lost to the Germans from 1870 to 1918, and again from 1940 to late 1944. No Frenchman could forget that it was in Strasbourg in 1792 that Rouget de Lille had composed what became the revered national anthem, La Marseillaise. Nor was there a French schoolchild who had not been moved to tears reading La Dernière Le Con, The Last Lesson, a touching short story by Alphonse Daudet about a schoolmaster's last class in the French language before German authorities in 1871 took charge. 
To abandon Strasbourg meant exposing thousands of Frenchmen to cruel German reprisal. More than that, to abandon Strasbourg was to serve up a part of the very soul of France. When the German First Army attacked an hour before midnight on New Year's Eve with five divisions and with two panzer divisions in reserve, the importance of Strasbourg to the French either escaped General Eisenhower or else he deemed military considerations to be overriding. At the first word of the attack, Eisenhower told Bedell Smith to call up Devers and tell him he is not doing what he was told. He wanted Devers to leave light screening forces on the plain between the Rhine and the Vosges and fall back on the mountains. That was as much as to say, abandon Strasbourg. As soon as the head of the French provisional government, Charles de Gaulle, learned of Eisenhower's directive, he promptly sent the chief of staff of the French Ministry of Defence, General Pierre Jouin, to Versailles to protest. In a fury, Jouin told Bedell Smith that France would never relinquish Strasbourg. Already de Gaulle had ordered the commander of the first French army, General Jean de Latre de Tassigny, to take responsibility for defending the city. General Smith's well-known temper flared, for de Gaulle's action not only represented defiance of Eisenhower as supreme commander, but unilateral alteration of an inter-army boundary. You go through with it, said Bedell Smith, and not one more bullet, not one more gallon of gasoline would the French army receive. In that case, responded Juin, the French government might deny American use of French railroads. If Eisenhower persisted, de Gaulle was prepared to withdraw the first French army from his command. It sounded like an argument in a schoolyard. It was in fact a clever ploy. Juin departed, knowing that he had left General Smith visibly shaken and that Smith would tell his chief everything. That would afford Eisenhower time to reconsider before he met with de Gaulle at de Gaulle's request the next afternoon. Lest the stratagem miscarry, de Gaulle that night cabled President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill for help. Roosevelt declined to intervene in what he considered to be a military matter. Scheduled to fly to Paris on January 3rd to lunch with Eisenhower, Churchill withheld his judgment. When the Prime Minister, delayed by bumpy flying weather over the Channel, reached Versailles around 2 p.m., General de Gaulle had already arrived, and at Eisenhower's invitation, Churchill sat in on the conference. Explaining the vital symbolic importance of Strasbourg to the French people, de Gaulle said that unless Eisenhower defended the city, he himself as head of state would be compelled to act independently. Of such importance was Strasbourg that he was prepared to risk losing the entire First French Army, rather than relinquish the city without a fight. Losing his temper, Eisenhower repeated Bedell Smith's threat to deprive the French Army of supplies. But in reality, even before opening the conference, he had begun to reconsider. The crisis in the Ardennes was past, and although Operation Nordwind was a heavy blow, Troops of the 7th Army by nightfall of the second day had almost brought the main effort to a halt. Besides, there must be no threat by the French to the US Army's lines of communication across France. He would instruct General Devers, said Eisenhower, to withdraw only from the tip of the salient in the extreme northeastern corner of France back some 20 miles to the little Moda River. He would adjust the inter-army boundary to give responsibility for defending Strasbourg to the French. As de Gaulle departed, immensely relieved, Prime Minister Churchill, who had said not a word during the deliberations, remarked quietly to Eisenhower, I think you've done the wise and proper thing. So did the commander of the 6th Army Group, General Devers, and the commander of the 7th Army, General Patch, for both saw Eisenhower's order to withdraw as premature. Fighting in bitter cold and heavy snow continued until January 25th, one column advancing out of the Colmar pocket got within 13 miles of Strasbourg, while another north of the city got within 9 miles. But Operation Nordwind ended with the Germans gaining nothing more than 20 miles of flat landscape of no tactical or strategic importance. The offensive cost the Germans 25,000 casualties, the Americans 15,600. Contrary to Adolf Hitler's goal, it produced no diminution of the American effort in the Ardennes. Lest the German operation should expand to the north, Eisenhower and Bradley on January 10th ordered Patton, over his strenuous objections, to send a division to back up his overextended 20th Corps in defensive positions facing the Saar. Patton chose the 4th Armoured Division, which was down to 42 medium tanks and badly needed a rest in any case. That was all.